Okay, hey everybody, how are you doing? Teching and Barry back again in my normal studio this week with all the limited space included. Yup, you know, as opposed to last week when I was in a basement that was actually spacious. I can move around and sort of like interact with my environment other than a rack of swords that constantly falls down and a literal brick. So yeah, plus it had an echo. There were a few people that were annoyed by the echo, but I personally liked it. It was nice to have the acoustics. Echo! 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 It's just not the same. Hey, at least we still have squeaky floorboard, Chan. Aw, we lost squeaky floorboard. Okay, we gotta get moving, okay? That was enough of the intro, all right? Have you read this chapter? I'm not talking to you as teching right now, I'm just talking to you as me. Hi, I'm Matt, nice to meet you, I like One Piece. Have you read this chapter? <laughs> it's, it's insanity, all right? And before we even get to it, I have to address the cover spread because the cover page spread is so unique um, and it's one of three, all right? Remember a few months back when the One Piece World Popularity Poll wrapped up? You know, so for a few months there, you could go on that website and you could vote for your favorite One Piece character every single day. And, you know, we wanted to find out who the most popular character was, you know, you know in a worldwide poll. And so that finally wrapped up. And the, one of the purposes of that was that the top 50 characters characters in that poll were going to be included in a massive triple double page spread. So double page, triple page, quadruple, quintuple, hextuple color page spread, you know, with all of the top 50 characters in the One Piece franchise, all right? So we get the first part of that today uh, with about 18 characters on it, maybe more actually. Uh, Boa Hancock is there and you also see Salome, uh, her snake, and I don't think uh, Salome was in the top 50, but Salome is there. Also, the Going Mary was also ranked in the top 50 and there is a boat in the background. Um, I don't really see the figurehead of the Mary, maybe it's on like another page, um, but that could be included too. But anyway, yeah, it's an amazing color spread. I wish I could just show it to you, but you know, so uh, go check it out. But we have Kaido, Big Mom, Odin, Yamato. Yamato ranked 11th actually on the World Pool, so it's crazy. Katakuri's there, Law, Boa Hancock, Doflamingo, Gecko Moria, Perona. We got Reiju, we got um, uh, Bartholomew Kuma, Pudding, Bartolomeo throwing up a barrier. Okiku's in the background. I mean, it's wild, and we're, and then Hyori is there as well. Hyori's is like way in the background, but we're gonna get this, I guess. Uh, every week uh, or every release of One Piece chapter, we're going to get a new edition of this uh, page spread. So it's like combines together to make like a, a, a triptych, the holy triptych of like the One Piece double page spreads. It's going to be wild. And I'm actually really pumped, not just for the straw hats, which will probably be in the center one, like all of the straw hats will be right in the center. But I'm actually also really excited for the greatest outlier on the poll, which of course was Mare Whoop Slap from Luffy's Village, who ranked like number 37 or something and I did a video on that and I completely didn't know why whoop slap ranks so high it wasn't until later that I found out it was because of Grand Line Review Liam yeah he did a thing where he's like hey everybody vote for whoop slap and they did and in case you don't know what that means that means whoop slap will forever be immortalized in this hex tuple page spread because of Grand Line Review that's wild you know and so um I can't wait to actually see what whoop slap's gonna be doing because all these different characters are like in battle poses like Odin's there with Ame no Habakiri and Enma and, you know, Yamato, you know, is about to bring down the Kanabo and everything like that. I, I would love, and, you know, Law's doing his shambles thing. I would love to just to see Whoop Slap in the middle of all this chaos amidst all these really strong One Piece characters like Eneru and you know, Ace and Crocodile and everybody. And Whoop Slap's just there with his cane. Just like, bring it on, you stupid kids! I'll smack you good! I'll slap you with my wood! I'm wood! slap, whoop slap, whatever. Like, I would just love that. Like a scene with Eneru bringing down the lightning and whoop slaps just there like, ah, you think you're so cool just because you can throw lightning bolts? Bring it on, Sonny. You know, either that or he's just going to be in the corner somewhere like, you know, shaking with terror. Like, why am I here? I'm too old for this. You know, I retired for a reason. You know, that would be great. Oh, man, I can't wait to see Whoop Slap. All right. So then we get the title, like the regular cover page with just uh, Vivi on it. Um, it's nothing special, but it's nice to see Vivi again. She's dancing and singing with some sparrows like she's a Disney princess, which yeah, kind of is. And uh, Karu's in the background sort of 
jealous. Um, I should also bring up that the mangaka of Nisekoi, Naoshi Komi, has actually redrawn a One Piece chapter that Oda did. So Oda did chapter 216, Vivi's Adventure, when Vivi, you know, and the Straw Hats separate, and, you know, they, they pull out the, the X marks on their arm as they sail away from Alabasta. The mangaka of Nisekoi redrew that whole chapter in his own art style, and it looks incredible. So go make sure to check that out as well. But now we finally get into the chapter proper, chapter 1023 review of One Piece, titled Spitting Image. So let's dive right in. Who's going to be the spitting image of who? I don't know, but let's find out. All right, so we pick up right where we left off, okay? We got Sanji, bam, kicking Queen in the face, and then we got uh, Zoro revived with the serum, slicing King down. And so they get knocked back, they fall down in a massive cloud of smoke, and they're just standing there, shoulder to shoulder, like, you know, let's do this. You know, we're almost one step away from Luffy becoming the Pirate King. We're going to be even closer after we win this fight, okay? Now, of course, they did just strike two of the uh, All-Stars, all right? So this is a big deal. We see a scene with King and Queen lying down. Queen, we don't really see his eyes, but King is just there like, like he got knocked down and he just, bam! Mm, all right, so we're doing this. So they don't really seem like they're all that injured from that. We see baby Gramps Chopper there, and he's just like, Wow, I can't believe it! They actually revived Zoro with that magical mink medicine! I am a little concerned about what's gonna happen afterwards, but I guess we'll find out. It's like Chopper has read the trope. You know, hmm, a medicine that revives you temporarily, but with a massive kickback afterwards. So, yeah, it's going to be really rough on Zoro, and I, what I think is going to happen here is, of course, we'll have the fight between between Zoro and King, and right after that fight is over, after King goes down, Zoro is going to be like, man, I gotta go help Luffy fight Kaido, and then he's just gonna, like, cough up like a, like a truckload of blood, like, a, like an Olympic-sized swimming pool amount of blood, and then he's just gonna collapse, okay, and he's gonna be out of the rest of the war, but we still got a cool fight to see. Um, so, some of the other members of the Beast Pirates obviously are like, hey, they just attacked our commanding officers, and they're just standing there posing, looking really cool. So they take out sniper rifles to try to shoot them. That's when Kalamatsu shows up and slices them all down with Sotsumo, his sword. And he's just like, no, nobody's going to interfere here. Either ally or enemy alike. Hyogoro steps up. He's still, he's back in action. I mean, he's probably still not ready to fight again, but he's back in action. And he's like, yeah, that's right. You know, none of the Yakuza will interfere here because some of the other ones are just like, hey, let's go help Zoro and Sanji. You know, Zoro, uh, Zoro, Juro, and Songoro. Let's go help them fight against the all-Stars. These are literally the strongest warriors directly under Kaido himself. They're going to need all the help they can get. And Hyo is just like, no, we're not doing that. Look at their faces. Look at the determination, okay? And can't you honestly tell this is a shonen manga? They are the main characters. We are merely but bit players in their story. So, yeah, that's basically what happens. And it's honestly like, if we get involved, we'll probably end up dying anyway in the crossfire. So, you know, just leave it up to them. Leave it up to them. So nobody else is going to get involved here. So, but before the fight really kicks off, before Sanji and Zoro really charge the All-Stars, we have Marco. And remember, Marco kind of showed up and blocked the attack last chapter, but then he was just like, hey, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm done fighting for the day, guys. Man, you guys are, whoa, you're pretty tough, King, but you know what? Now it's time for Zoro and Sanji to shine. I'm just going to back off here. So Marco is still just hanging out right next to the battlefield, kind of dangerous, honestly. And he starts a flashback. He starts thinking about the time that uh, Whitebeard told him about King's race. And that was really cool because I assumed like that's probably where Marco heard it from at some point. Whitebeard was telling this story. He might have had some drinks as well from what we're going to learn. Maybe Whitebeard was drinking a little bit too much one night and he's like, Hey Marco, have you ever heard about uh, the gods that live on top of the red line? Oh, man, this is good sake. Marco's just like, what are you talking about, Pops? On top of the red line? The only thing on top of the red line is Marie Joie and this truck. Okay, the only thing on top of the red line is Marie Joie. What are you talking about? And so Pops is just like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not talking about Marie Joie. I'm talking about years ago, like hundreds of years back. Maybe it was thousands. I don't know. But they say back in the day, gods used to live up there. Glug, glug. And so... <laughs> Oh boy, this is gonna be good. Hold off for right now. 
little bit later, we got to cover some other stuff. This is all going to link back together, okay? We find out the name of King's race in this chapter as well, which is a big deal in of itself, okay? But just hold off. But yeah, that's where Marco heard it at some point. Whitebeard was just probably drunk one night and told him this story that... Marie-Joie was not always the castle, Pangea Castle was not always on top of the red line, which we assumed, of course, obviously the world government would have built that as soon as they took power. But he says, you know, no, back in the day, long, long time ago, probably during the void century and, you know, even before that, um, a race of gods lived on top of the red line. Okay, so just, you know, keep that in mind. So, while this is going on, as I said, Marco is not moving. He's literally just daydreaming this flashback as he's standing right in the middle of a freaking war zone, right? And so he's like, <laughs> oh, Pops, you're a cool guy. And then people are shooting at him, and Izo jumps in, just like, Marco, what are you doing? Get down, man! And he just, he grabs, like, scoops Marco up in his arms, and Izo just starts booking it out of there. And, you know, Marco's like, oh, hey, man, how you doing? And he's like, it's been a while, Izo. And just like, no, we just saw each other on the boat a little while ago. Let's get out of here. What are you doing? Just, you know, daydreaming in the middle of a battlefield. And he's like, oh, well, I knew you would save me after all. I'm a bit winded from that battle. Um, hey, Izo, uh, do you believe in God? Or do you believe in the gods of this world? And then Izo's just like, what are you talking about? We don't have time for this. Let's get out of here. And he just, but you sound like Pops when he had too much to drink. Let's go. And so they just run away. Izo does not give Marco a serious answer. Um, but I love this. I love this so much because this is touching upon a piece of world building that Oda he's addressed before sort of indirectly and it's been referenced in a bunch of different ways but it's never been like overtly discussed um what is the religion what is the prominent religion or like the uh the pantheon of deities or like is it you know monotheistic polytheistic how does the religion of the one piece world work right and it was addressed as i said like obviously eneru claimed to be god but he was not a real god he was just you know had a god complex and the power of lightning and so everybody in skypea just revealed him as a god. Um, there was talk of the uh, the sea gods, you know, like that barrel they found before Thriller Bark, you know, oh, people will throw stuff out to the sea gods for worship, and that makes sense after all, since most of the One Piece world is water, there'd be probably a bunch of different, like, storm gods like Poseidon, and, and just, like, sea and ocean gods in general. Um, but there's so many, there's so many kinds of opportunities for this, where Oda could have delved more into this religious kind of, like, part of the world, and he never did. And also, there was the time that uh, Nami almost got Got married to Absalom at Thriller Bark, which was like a very like Catholic church with like the cross and everything like that. And uh, so that, that was the way that was laid out, like a Catholic church. So yeah, this is finally being addressed now and, and I love it, okay? Uh, not crazy, like we don't go a lot into it in this chapter, but it seems to imply that like at one point, there was a species that lived on top of the red line and they were revered as gods. And that might have been the prominent religion in the One Piece world worshiping We'll get to it in a second. Worshipping this race on top of the red line. Then the world government showed up and the void century happened and they kicked these literal gods off of the red line, built up Marijua and the world government has effectively become the main religion in the world. Like, kind of like a state religion sort of situation. Um, and even the symbol of the world government, I mean, it it looks like a cross, right? Okay, so maybe that's the case. We're just like, hey, there was this prominent religion that everybody kind of worshipped, and then the world government took over and is like, hey, you're not doing that anymore. You worship us. Okay, basically forming it together like religion and uh, the government into one thing, like a theocracy kind of situation. Maybe, maybe something like that, right? And so Whitebeard is reminiscing about the times when, you know, it was different. And so Marco remembers that. That's why he asked Izo, like, hey, do you believe in God? Like, that is not something, like, I think I remember during, um, uh, during Alabast, not Alabast, the Skypea, Chopper asked Zoro that question, like, hey, Zoro, do you believe in God? And Zoro's just like, eh, I really don't care. Uh, but it doesn't get brought up very often in One Piece, right, outside of Skypea, because of those kind of overtones. But, um, yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of going full speed with this now. We're probably going to find out more about it as we go. So now we cut over to King and Queen. They get back up. They announce that, like, that, those attacks they did last 
last chapter, while really cool with that double page spread, um, did not really do a lot of damage. You know, Queen is going on and on about how he's like, you don't understand. We are the all-stars. We are the three plagues of Kaido-sama's wrath. We are the wildfire. We are the plague and the drought. But, you know, Jack's off, you know, I don't know, taking a shit or something. I don't know. But we are the wildfire and the plague. You will fight us. You know, you cannot defeat us, right? And so, at this point, we have Queen just bombarding uh, Sanji with a bunch of lasers from his mouth. And as he's dodging, as Zoro and Sanji are both dodging this volley of lasers, Sanji kind of admits to Zoro, like, my body feels a little bit off. It feels a little bit weird. And Zoro's like, what are you talking about? You better not be going, you know, you know, soft on me. You better not be getting weak here. And, you know, Sanji's like, no, 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 no. It's nothing like that. I don't feel, I don't feel weak or drained or anything. I just feel off, like weird. Like, like ever since I used my raid suit the second time, I felt like this. I was a little confused by this because Sanji's used the raid suit more than twice. Um, I don't know if they're referring to the time during the actual battle where he went into his stealth black suit to, ca to you know, get Momo back from Kaido, um, or that because he was, he first transformed into his raid suit against page one, and then he went back to normal, and then he went into the suit again to spy on Nami and Robin in the bath, and then he did it a third time here when he was actually getting Momo back, okay? So, I don't know, but he might have been referring to, like, the second time he used it back in the bathhouse or whatever. But he's like, you know, the point is, multiple consecutive uses of the raid suit are causing a strange reaction with his body. But he says he doesn't feel weak. He's like, I could still fight, it's just a little bit off here, okay? Where is this going? Well, <laughs> where is it not going? Okay, so at this point, King finally takes out his sword and slashes down at Zoro, and Zoro kind of blocks the attack from Sanji, and he's just like, bam, yeah, you damn cook, now you owe me one. At the same time this happens, Queen takes out his cyborg claw about to attack Zoro, Sanji shows up, bam, kicks Queen away, it's like, now we're even. Okay, so, you know, Zoro and Sanji, they have a rivalry together, you know, they get on each other's nerves, but when it comes down to the thick of it, and they're in the battle together, they're a perfect machine, okay? They're gonna cover each other's backs, they're still Nakama, they're Straw Hat Pirates, you know, they might bicker at each other to have, like, a little bit of comic relief, or whatever it is, but, you know, when it comes down to it, they're good in battle, like, together, you know, they're a really unstoppable force, okay? So, after that attack, the queen is like, oh yeah, I remember now, how could I forget? You're Judge's kid, and Judge's kids are all genetically modified humans, or cyborgs. The literal translation is cyborgs. Queen does refer to them as a cyborg, okay? But then there's also the term, like, genetically modified human. Obviously, like, uh, the Germa siblings, like Reiju, and, you know, Ichiji, and Niji, and Yonji, they aren't cyborgs in the typical sense, like the pacifistas, or, uh, or like, kumas, like, the pacifistas are just robots, but you know what I mean, like the PX0, or like Frankie, you know, that have organic and robotic components, um, they're more like genetically modified, okay? Their skin is a lot more tough, it's akin to steel, um, and they have other alterations, but it, they were born like that. They were born like that with all of the different drugs that Judge basically forced Sola to take, and all the genetic modifications, they were born, and then they grew like an outer shell later on in life, so that's the way that they were raised, okay? Uh, but still, Cyborg is maybe the correct term. I'm not really sure how you'd refer to that. I would just refer to them as like um, enhanced humans or, you know, something like that, okay? But anyway, uh, Queen's like, yeah, you're Judge's kid and they were all modified, so that must be the reason why you can light your damn leg on fire and, you know, Diablo Jambe and all that kind of crap. Oh, it all makes sense now. That leg of yours must be a, pe a piece of machinery or must have some enhancements to it. And Sanji, of course, gets really upset by this. He gets upset anytime anybody compares him to the Vin Smokes. Anytime he even hears the word Vin Smoke, he hates it. So he's just like, you know, screw off. No, no, I, I light my leg on fire with my passion. My heart blazes with the passion of a billion suns. I, I'm a hundred percent human. I have none of these modifications. Do not speak about me to the germa. Okay, now. <laughs> oh, damn it, Oda. Damn it. When will we learn? This man is a madman. Okay, so. A long time ago, when Sanji first used Diabu Jumbe, 
during his fight with Jabra at CP9, at his lobby with the CP9, okay? Somebody asked Oda a question in the SBS, like, you know, and you can expect this kind of question. How the hell could Sanji light his damn leg on fire? Now, during the fight with Jabra, he did give an explanation. He spun around wicked fast, and he, you know, through the friction, it just ignited his leg on fire, right? And uh, since then, actually, he hasn't really had to spin. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he could just, like, pyrokinetically light his damn leg on fire at this point right? Well, anyway, the reason Oda gave in the SBS was like, oh, well, it's because he burns with the passion. His heart is blazing with passion, and that's why he can, it can't be contained in his actual body, so that's why he lights his leg on fire. It was something like, you know, Diablo Jambe might burn hot, but Sanji's heart burns ever hotter. And you know what? Because it's a manga, and because we've seen so much wacky shit up until this point, I just went with it. I just went with it. I was just like, okay, he can light his leg on fire. And it's also the reason why his pants don't get burned or his shoes or socks don't get burned. And he can turn it on and off at will. It's like, fine, whatever. It's manga. I'll roll with it. That was literally Oda just messing with us. It was like, there's a reason. I'm not going to give you the reason. I'm going to give you this like fake joke reason but you might think it's the reason, but it's not the reason. It's like, okay, it's like whenever Oda answers questions like, how far can Luffy stretch with his Gamu Gamu no Mi? Or what's the range of Robin's Hana Hana? Like, what's the range of how far out she can make her limbs appear or whatever? And Oda never gives actual measurements. He's like, oh yeah, Luffy can probably stretch his arm, uh, I'd say about uh, 1,000 Gamu Gamus. You know, 1,000 Gamu Gamus, give or take. And Robin, oh well, Robin, you know, probably about 500 Hana Hanas. He makes up measurements. They don't mean anything, right? But I don't think that's because Oda doesn't care or he's just never thought about it before. Obviously, Luffy has a range with his stretching powers. It's the reason why he doesn't just grab onto Onigashima and Gamu Gamu no Rocket back up. It's too high up. It's out of his range, okay? And Robin obviously cannot spawn her limbs like an island away or anything like that to like open an eye on another island to see what's going on there. Obviously, she can't do that. There is a definite range with these abilities, and Oda has probably like a rough idea in his head, but but maybe Oda himself doesn't want to just break it down to like, okay, uh, Luffy's range is uh, 100 meters or 500 meters or whatever, like a stand power in JoJo's or something. It's like, so Oda is not married to a single number. He can just kind of make it do like whatever. Like, can Luffy reach up and grab the moon? No. Can he reach up and grab the top of a building? Sure. You know, it's basically he keeps it whatever he wants, okay? And the situation with that is, like, he gives out so many joke answers. Sometimes, they're like, is he being serious or is he covering for something else? This is a situation where he's covering for something else. Bear with me on this. So, Sola took all of the drugs and she gave birth to Reiju first, but then, a few years later, Ichiji, Niji, Sanji, and Yonji were all born together. Sanji was the lone exception. It seemed like the treatments, the drugs did not work on him because Sola also downed even more drugs to counteract the effect. So Ichiji, Niji, and Yonji were all born with the genetic modifications and, um, you know, the personality, you know, the way that they were modified to always obey judge and have, like, a lack of empathy and everything. Sanji was the only one that was born seemingly normal in that capacity, right, with no enhanced abilities. Wouldn't it be interesting if he does have said abilities and the raid suit that Niji gave him, the stealth black suit, was designed as like uh, training wheels or to kind of like, um, you know, uh, activate the dormant power in him. To sort of like, oh, they studied this for years and they developed the stealth black suit to like, you know, help awaken Sanji's true potential, his true power if he wears it long enough, okay? Um, now, Sanji has his own personality. He has a sense of empathy. He cares about about his friends. He has all those emotions that his brothers lack, okay? Uh, and he doesn't have to obey Judge, even like Reiju. Reiju still has her emotions as well, but she cannot disobey Judge. You know, when Judge gives an order, she is conditioned to obey him. So Sanji, wouldn't it be cool if what Sola did, which ultimately led to her death, I remind you, what Sola did was, like, allow Sanji to have his own sense of self, so he can be his own person and he can care about other things, but he also did get the badass genetic modification 
activations in the process. It just took a little while and the stealth black suit to help like activate it, okay? But that's the reason why he can light his leg on fire. Maybe that's the reason he had to spin really fast at first. Like his body had the potential, but he couldn't do it at will yet. Okay, so that's all well and good for Sanji and we'll definitely be talking about that later, definitely. But uh, that's not the coolest thing that happens here. Far from it. The coolest thing that happens here, which ironically involves fire, as it happens, is Queen gives the name of uh, King's race. Because Queen's like, oh, you must have judges modifications. And Sanji's like, no, I, I can just like light my leg on fire with passion. And Queen's like, oh, come on. It's not like you're a Lunar Ian or anything. Whoa, Lunar Ian. Okay. So Lunar, Moon, Moon, we're going to the moon. Finally. Man, me and King of Lightning were right. It's going to the moon, everybody. The moon is relevant again. I mean, it was always relevant, let's be honest here. But, I mean, yeah. All right, so the name of King's race, which purportedly is the same race that existed at the top of the red line before Marijois, which is the land of the gods, which the reason Marijois is called the land of the gods might not just be something that the world government established. That might have always been considered the land of the gods, which means the world government might have wanted the top of the red line, not because geography is everything, but but because it was already considered the land of the gods, so they thought we're gonna get up there, we're gonna wipe out the gods, we're gonna build our own homeland in a place that was already called the land of the gods because only the people that stand on top of the red line could be considered gods! <laughs> okay, we good? Barry, you all right? We might have to check my blood pressure after this. Okay, so that's where we're at right now. Um, so Lunarian, sun god Nika, Lunarian, sun and moon, uh, uh, Pokemon Sun and Moon, uh, it wasn't really that great of a game, I mean, it was okay, I guess, you know, it wasn't my favorite, you know, and, and an Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon was pretty much the exact same thing, so that's whatever, I mean, Shield and Sword was better. Okay, so, we're getting a lot of lore in the last few chapters, if you haven't noticed. Uh, this just seems to be the time in the story where Oda decides to talk about religion and gods and get them involved in the greater picture of the One Piece story. So there are probably going to be solar deities like Nika, and there's also going to be moon deities like the Lunarians, which King is part of. Um, what does this exactly mean? Um, maybe the solar deities, uh, like the sun god Nika, um, the silhouette that we saw of Nika when Who's Who was talking about him, did he have wings? I'm picturing the silhouette with wings right now, but I'm not sure. Um, but if he had wings, maybe they're the original, like the Skypean wings, like the big, you know, feathery, you know, white wings that we always see the Skypeans and the Bierkins and the Shandorians have, okay? And maybe the solar deities, the Solarians or whatever that lived way back then, maybe they were the uh, precursors, the originators for the Skypean races, okay? But then there was also a group called uh, the Lunarians that had black wings. And so they were another maybe origin for another species or something. And then like they lived on top of the red line together, maybe. Maybe they each shared a hemisphere. Like the one hemisphere was where the solar deities lived. And then another hemisphere was where the, the, uh, the Lunarians lived because it covers the entire planet. Maybe, maybe the gods built the red line. Like they, in the beginning, there was nothing. There was not but a massive sea. And then the gods of the sun and the moon rose the red earth out of the ground through the ocean and the great red wall was built. I don't know, maybe. Oh God, okay. We got a lot to talk about. There's gonna be a few videos this week about this, okay? But we get the name of King's Race. It's related to the moon. Lunar is there. We got Nika, who's a sun god. So that's gonna be relevant. Uh, we're gonna have some sort of sun moon religion revealed during this story. We gotta keep moving on with the chapter because that's not even the coolest thing. I mean, that's pretty cool, but there's a cooler thing later and then even a cooler thing after that. So we gotta get moving, but yeah. Let me know below on what you think about this. I will be making follow-up videos this week regarding this. Okay, but we're going to the moon. That's the way I take this. Yup. So Sanji is convinced though. He's like, I'm 100% human. I can just light my leg on fire because of the passion in me. And so he activates Diablo Jamba and he begins to kick the crap out of Queen. Queen responds with all of his armament hockey and his uh, cyborg enhanced limbs. And he's just like, ah, you don't understand, child. I am a cyborg that even Vegapunk could not create. Vegapunk himself could not best me in this form. Bring it, Sanji. And so they begin clashing there. We're gonna find out way more about this as we go, probably more 
more about Mads, more about Sanji and his true powers. But I think that's the situation with Sanji's suit. It was designed to awaken his powers that were lying dormant in him with the Germa tech, okay? Okay, so now we cut over to Zoro fighting King proper. This is epic. We find out a lot of stuff here. Okay, so the first thing is, you know, Zoro's got his three sword style. He's got Enmai in one hand, Sandai Katetsu in the other, and he has his trusty Wadoichi Manji in his mouth, okay? Now, King's sword, he takes that out. It has a very unique shape to it, okay? Basically, uh, it is a katana, just a very large katana because King is a big man. And uh, basically, the front, like the, the top half of the blade is basically the same as like a regular katana. But from, you know, here to the guard, basically, there's a bunch of these little slits, like slots in the blade. And so Zoro doesn't see these, so when he takes Enma and the Sandai to strike him with a two-sword style technique, his katana blades actually get wedged inside of these slots. And then King just kind of... And he rips Zoro's swords out of his hands. All right? Now, this is very cool. I thought this was a weapon that Oda just invented. Like, oh, that's clever to have slots in the blades to actually grab an opponent's sword, and then you twist and lock them into place, and then you just pull it away and disarm your opponent in one fell swoop. So I thought this was Oda's creation, right? Um, this morning, a fan of mine from Germany actually sent me an email. His name was Alex, so thank you, Alex. Sent me an email explaining that this is actually a weapon that has a existed and uh, sent me a link to a YouTube channel called Shoddyversity, which go check that channel out because it's all about like, you know, uh, cool, like unconventional weapons of like antiquity. It's a really awesome channel. So go check out that. I subscribed this morning. It's really cool. And this is actually a weapon called the Sword Breaker. All right. Epic name, I know. Now, it's not meant to be a sword breaker in the sense, like a literal sense of actually breaking your opponent's sword. The term is actually used to like break your opponent's style or break their swordsman because they can't use their swords if you like rip them away from them, okay? So breaking swords in that kind of sense, okay? But as you can see here from these images, it's not just a slot in the blade. It's actually a slot that curves downwards and there's a little place where the sword actually gets stuck and then there's a hook at the end of it. So when, you're, so when your opponent attacks, you, you grab their swords, you just twist, and it basically gets locked in this hook, and your opponent can't pull them away, and then you, boom, you disarm them in one fell swoop. This is a weapon that actually existed. It makes sense. It was during, like, the Renaissance in Europe, and it makes sense because back in the day, you know, before guns, everybody fought with swords and shit, right? And so it would make sense that at some point people would be like, man, we should make a weapon that is uh, able to disarm swords and shit, right? And so this thing was created, all right? And there's a bunch of different variations of the these. Obviously, King is using an exaggerated form here that's like a big katana. And, uh, you know, in, in Renaissance Europe, they would not be katanas. But, right, you know what I mean? Like, you know, Oda's taking some liberty here, but this is the basic concept that exists. So, thanks to Alex for uh, sending me that link, and thanks to Shotiversity for, you know, a new channel to watch, okay? So, pretty, pretty damn cool, okay? So, with this, he has effectively disarmed Zoro of Enma and his Sandai, and knocks them away. In the meantime, you know, King is wearing that BDSM gimp suit, he takes his leather glove and like spikes just shoot out of the glove and he just BAM goes to hit Zoro right in the face. Luckily, this attack would normally work on most people disarming swords, but Zoro has swords for days. Swords for days, swords for days, or at least he has three. He has one right now, but he has his Wado left in his mouth. So when King goes to punch him in the face, Zoro uses the Wado to just BAM, you know, like block the attack right there. And at the same time, he admits, like, oh, I get it now. You're just like a murder machine, or you're just like a bloodthirsty brute. You're not a swordsman. And I guess that makes sense because King never claimed to be a swordsman. And he's just like, yeah, absolutely, right? And he's like, I never really understood why people stick to, like, you know, tradition and techniques and, like, martial arts and shit. King definitely subscribes to the idea of, like, a battle is a, bl uh, is a battle. It is a bloodbath, okay? And you you do whatever you gotta do to win the fight, okay? If you can hide a bunch of blades and guns and lasers and shields and all these uh, tactics to disarm your opponent, whatever gives you the advantage in battle, you take it. That is basically King's battle philosophy right there. And so Zoro lands, and you know, Zoro's all about honor and Bushido and using the sword, like the way of the sword, you know, scars on the back are a swordsman's shame, and like, he's fought against plenty of swordsmen up until this point that don't subscribe to those ideals. Like, 
like if Zoro ever fought against Shiryu, it would be a very different kind of idea here. So he lands on the ground, and he does manage to pick up his Enma and his Sanda. I guess King sort of lets him, I guess. And he arm him and hockeys up his Enma. And he's like, you know what? That's okay, because... You know, swordsmanship or whatever. I'm just viewing you as just a pile of swords and muscle. And you're just charging at me like a wild animal. And that's okay because I can't afford to lose this battle either. Even if it comes down to me like biting out your throat with my teeth, then we'll do that. Let's go. And so he charges at King. So this could very well be the bloodiest damn battle that Zoro has of the entire series, okay? Because he's basically just admitted that, like, hey, you never claimed to be a swordsman. You never claimed to... You carried a sword, but that doesn't mean you're a swordsman. That doesn't mean you subscribe to Honor or Bushido or anything like that. It would actually have been really funny if the sword King had wasn't even a sword. Maybe he just takes it out of his hilt and it was like a gun the whole time. Like, draw your sword, swordsman! Okay, shing, boom, you know, like, like it's all deception. It's all everything to get, uh, you know, any sort of advantage in battle. That's what all a king is about. And of course, king is covered in the gimp suit. So, you know, all these different weapons and stuff that could be hidden inside of there, are they part of his body? Were the spikes that came out of his glove, were they just part of the mechanism of his suit? Or was that like actually part of his body where he could summon blades and like attack people or whatever, right? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, who knows? So with Zoro and his three swords, all hockeyed up, he begins his fight with King, and then we immediately cut over to Hyogoro and uh, Kawamatsu, just hanging out, observing the battle. This fight commentary of Roranora pirate hunter Zolo Zoro versus against King the Conflagration, Confla King the Wildfire, will be commentated by uh, Kawamatsu the Kappa and Hyogoro the uh, boss of the Yakuza, so they're on the background, right? And they're talking, and uh, Kawamatsu's basically like, hey, uh, boss Hyo, uh, it was a little strange when Hiori asked Zoro to have the Enma, you know, because this is the sword that, you know, Odin had, and it's very precious to the scabbards, you know, they wouldn't want anybody to just grab this sword and take it on their own. This is a sword that belonged to Odin, and then Hiori, and then Hiori gave it to Zoro. So Kawamatsu says, you know, there's a reason I didn't really uh, speak up about that. I just kind of let Hiori give away Odin's sword. And the reason was because, um, and I'm sure you saw it too, Boss Hio, and Hio's like, yes, I did, Kawabatsu. Uh, Zoro looks remarkably like the former daimyo of the Ringo region, Ushimaru, uh, wait, Wait, yeah, Ushimaru Shimosuke. Yeah, it was Onimaru, that was the fox. Ushimaru was the samurai, he was the daimyo. He's like, he looks just like Ushimaru Shimosuke did in his younger days. Okay, he was, of course, the daimyo that eventually fought Kaido, you know, alongside um, Yasu and everybody else. And Yasu survived, but all the other daimyos died. And then Onimaru stayed behind to protect Ringo and the graveyards and everything like that as Gyukimaru, right? So he's like, yeah, when uh, Ushimaru was younger, he looked just like Zoro. And on top of that, that's not even where this ends. Because they talk about Ushimaru a little bit, like Ushimaru was unparalleled with the sword in his own right, but Ushimaru was also the descendant, the direct descendant of Shimosuke Ryuma. Yeah. So, great, 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 great grandson of Ryuma, because Ryuma lived like 400 years ago. And so, we already knew that there was a comparison between Zoro and Ryuma. They look a lot alike, and then Ushimaru also looks like Zoro and Ryuma as well. So, there's that connection. But then, Kawamatsu goes on to say, wow, it's even more strange when you know that he was the one, Zoro was the one, to return Ryuma's sword, Shusui, to its rightful place. And we actually do finally get to see the shrine, the tomb, the grave of Ryuma. We see it in a little scene where there's this really epic tomb. It's probably underground, uh, probably all, you know, uh, cornered off so nobody can just go in there and deface it, um, except for Moria, I guess. And we see Shusui sitting in the grave, because that's how people of Ringo do it. You know, after you die, your sword basically serves as your grave marker. We see, like, this Shinto temple, uh, and we see Shusui right in the center where it's currently resting. This is where Zoro is going to go after the battle, after the war. He's probably going to go meet and pay respects to Ryuma's grave before he leaves Wana, right? So we see that. That's cool. But that's not even the craziest thing! The craziest thing is... Zoro looks like Ushimaru, who is just related to Ryuma, and brought back Shusui, which was Ryuma's sword, and Ryuma was a one-eyed swordsman 
just like Zoro. And we see a scene of Ryuma in flashback. He's a little bit obscured in silhouette, but we see him living as a human, not as a mummy like he was on Thriller Bark. And we see that he had a scar on his uh, on his uh, left eye, just like Zoro. And uh, then there's like another scar over here that we actually did see Thriller Bark. Remember, if you go back and look at Thriller Bark, um, Ryuma did not have any eyes. He was a mummy at that point. He was mummified in the cold of Ringo. And so his eyes, you know, they uh, rotted away, of course. And then he got brought back with the shadow powers of the Kage Kage no Mi by Moria with Brooke's shadow. So he didn't have any eyes during Thriller Bark, so we didn't know. But yeah, during life, he only had one eye. He was a one-eyed swordsman. And Zoro's a one-eyed swordsman. And he looks like Ryuma. I don't know if this is going to be leading, in, leading into a thing as obvious as, like, you know, Zoro is Ushimaru's son or grandson, like it's a direct descendant, like there's Ryuma 400 years ago, he slayed a dragon, it was really epic, and then his great 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 grandson was Ushimaru Shimosuke, and then his son or grandson, depending on the timelines, was Zoro, who ended up in the east, in Shimosuke village that was founded by Kozaboro Shimosuke. Would that work? Could Kozaboro Shimosuke have been the son of Ushimaru. No, I don't think the timeline would have worked for that. They might have been brothers. Ushimaru and Kozaboro Shimosuke might have been brothers. Zoro is definitely related to Ryuma, but I don't think it's going to be a direct line to him. Uh, well, maybe it could have been. I don't know. I don't know. I got to think about this, but there's a connection there. We knew about that, uh, and it was just addressed directly here in this chapter, and we found out some more about Ryuma. We got to see his shrine. We got to see Ushimaru and what he actually looked like. That's cool, okay? And so, uh, Zoro, we just see him clashing with King in battle. Uh, does King have two swords as well? No, he only still has the one sword. He has the one sword, but he's got spikes, kind of like Katakuri. Katakuri had all that leather and the straps and the spikes coming out of his shoes and everything, and, and King has kind of a similar aesthetic there. So now, we're still not done with the chapter yet. We got pages. So now we cut over to Jack fighting Inu Arashi, and uh, Jack is like stomping around as a mammoth. It's cool that we get to see all of the all-stars in this chapter. And he's like, you know, whatever, I don't even care. You know, you basically gave up your entire homeland to save one samurai. I don't even care about that anymore, right? And so Inu Arashi is like having this talk, this talk with Jack, like, Jack, you know, we were willing to end a thousand year civilization on Zo to keep a promise with Odin, to keep a promise with the Kozuki clan, to keep Raizo safe. And you know, for the last 20 years, while we ran and went back to Zo, I asked myself, every time I woke up, am I still a samurai? We abandoned Odin. We left Wano. Can we ever return? Can we ever repay that debt that Odin gave us, you know? Um, are we still samurai? And then finally, when everything happened, he's like, this is where we make our stand right here. This is where we do it. So he grabs Jack by the tusk, and they, they throw each other out of the walls. They land in like a courtyard in Onigashima, and Jack gets up, and he's like, oh, whatever. He looks over at Inu Arashi, who's now in his sulong. And Jack's like, what? How could you be so long? We're still... And he looks up, and there's like a hole in the ceiling with the moon shining down. I don't know if it's the same hole that Kaido made, or if it's just because of all the battles another hole was created. Or maybe it was the hole when Luffy used Red Rock up there. I don't know. But anyway, he looks up, and he sees like a hole in the ceiling, and there's the moon, no cloud cover, shining down. So we have... It's not going to last very long, but we have Inu Arashi in his so long, like, Bring it, Jack! You know, we avenge Odin tonight, and it's only after you die that we can bring the dawn of this world and so he charges at jack um that is such a cool scene there it's only a brief moment but just the fact of what he says of like we put the the civilization of zunisha of zo that's been around for a thousand years we put that on the line for a wager to see the dawn of the new world and we will see the dawn of that. And so he attacks Jack. Now we cut over to Nekamamushi, who also, being a mink, has access to Sulong. The moon is shining down. He knocked Perospero outside of the Skull Dome. Perospero lands, and he's like, oh, man, is that a giant cat that just scratched me? Is a cat scratch fever? Oh, man. I'm, uh, you know, I think Perospero should just get up and leave, honestly. You know what? You know what? I don't even care anymore. I don't even care. Fine. I killed Pedro. I'm responsible for every battle. 
bad thing that's ever happened. I don't even care anymore. I'm out of here. Right, but Nekomumushi would not let him go. He lands right next to Wanda and Carrot. They're still damaged. They're still recovering. But hey, hey, the moon's up there, so we can still have it. Nekomumushi is in his Sulong form, and he's just like, you know, Gyornyao! The dawn will rise. But I'll tell you what, Pero Sparrow, this will be the last moon you'll ever gaze upon. And then he charges at Pero Sparrow. And then Wanda and Carrot are there, so they could maybe go into their Sulong. Doesn't have to last long. Just has to last for like 10 seconds just to get one final triple attack on Pero Sparrow and finally end him. That would be nice, right? So we have that. Uh, and then uh, we also have the kind of the final scene of the chapter. It kind of leads into the final scene. We see a brief moment with Raizo fighting Fuku Rokuju. And there's still, you know, Fuku Rokuju is still going on about how you're just ghost Raizo. You're still fighting or whatever. And you're following a literal child. Like literally your goal here is to get a child, Momonosuke, on the throne or whatever. That's ridiculous. And Raizo is like, do not, um, do not disrespect the youth of the world. They will be the ones that will carry the torch. And yes, Momonosuke might be young now, but this is his birthright, and after we win, and after he becomes the Shogun, we will raise him, and we will make sure that he he becomes a great Shogun, all right, after this. In the, in the name of Odin, we will make sure that he grows up right. Transition now to Tokage Port, where we have Law's crew there, and they are freaking out because Kaido has apparently just appeared right in front of them. And I love the reaction to uh, Law's crew, the Heart Pirates, because it's like a reaction like, imagine, okay, <laughs> imagine you're playing D&D. All right, you're playing D&D, and, uh, you know, you, before you start, you know a little bit about the game. You're looking through the monster manual, like, wow, look at all these monsters that are in the monster manual. Like, look at all these dragons. Like, man, ancient red dragon challenge rating, like, 23 or some shit. That's crazy. Maybe someday we'll get to fight those. So you start your campaign, and you're, like, level one, and you have some really simple adventures. You know, you level up, level two, level three. Let's say you're all level five. You're all level five. There's like three of you. And you're traveling along. You know, you're going to the next city. He's like, oh, there's an old man in the next city that claims to know where a magic sword is. I'm like, all right. We're walking along. DM is like, roll perception. Hmm. Nobody gets it? Okay. An ancient red dragon breath weapons you from above. <laughs> That's the reaction that Law's Chris. What? We're doing this now? What? Uh, grab the weapons! Grab all of the weapons! Uh, okay, we're, we're doing it! Let's go! Bard, sing the song! <laughs> you know, like, okay, like, uh. <laughs> That's how they're reacting. They're pulling out their swords and their guns. Like, are we ready for this? No, we're not. No, you're not. But here you go. So they think Kaido is attacking them. Caribou jumps up on Jean Bart's like shoulder, like, help me, <laughs> you know? And so we see a giant dragon on the beach of uh, Tokage Port and Luffy's right in front of him, not scared at all. And everyone's like, straw hat, get away from him. And Luffy just kind of looks at the dragon and he's like, that's you, right, Momo? And the dragon's like, yup, get on, Luffy. Let's go save my country. It's like, damn straight. And so let's go beat Kaido. And so uh, Shinobu goes bawling up to Luffy, like crying, and Luffy's like, what's wrong with you? And she's like, ah, oh, <laughs> I did what Lord Momonosuke asked. I used my ripe, ripe jutsu to age him up to 28 years old. And Luffy's like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know you could do that. So why are you crying? And she's like, because the young lord looks just like... And then she trails off. And we see a scene when Shinobu first, um, you know, aged up Momo and she starts crying. We can assume that Momo at age 28 will look remarkably like Odin did at age 28. Um, you know, maybe, maybe also Shinobu could be like, you know, oh, you, you look just like Odin, but you have Toki's eyes or, or something like that. You know, maybe like you have the power of Odin, but like the gentleness of Toki. Maybe something like that. Like, like Shinobu will be like, you look just like your parents, basically. And so uh, that's why she's crying. And then Luffy just looks to Momo and just like, let's go back to Onigashima. Let's go back there. Um, let's take back Wano. And then that's the end of the chapter. So, um, got to talk about this too. Uh, the dragon that Momo transforms into is a spitting image of Kaido. So much so that the Heart Pirates thought that it was Kaido that descended. And it's a giant dragon. Is it the same size as Kaido? Uh, 
I still think Kaido is a bit bigger, because Kaido was so damn big, he took up, like, the whole sky. Here, the dragon is huge, uh, and the head is, like, several times the size of Luffy's own body, but I think that the dragon is still slightly smaller than Kaido, because Kaido's probably, like, in his 50s, and I'm almost 28, okay? But still, looks just like Kaido. The facial features, uh, the flaming clouds. Momo is covered in the, the same flaming clouds that Kaido has that allows him to fly. Looks just like him, and it seems that Momo has control over this and enough control to spawn the flame clouds the same way Kaido can so the aging process you know like I, I made a video about this where I talked about like maybe it's like the way that Gon aged up in Hunter x Hunter where it wasn't just him aging it was him acquiring all that knowledge and power uh, and skill and technique in one fell swoop okay it might be something similar to that where Momo is aged age 28 but it's like all of the experience all of the training that he would have learned in that 20 year period, um, it, it just happens. Now, you could say, well, that's kind of cheap. That's kind of broken if you could just do that. Well, you also have to remember, Momo, he's skipping over 20 years of his life, so he might have the power and technique from that, uh, but he's still going to die sooner. He just skipped 20 years of his life. His whole childhood, his teenage years, you know, you know, his awkward early 20s, all that stuff just got skipped, and now he is at age 28. And then, you know, he's not getting those years back. You know, Momo cannot, I mean, uh, Shinobu cannot rewind time. Uh, maybe people have brought up that maybe Bonnie, if Bonnie ever shows up, you know, meets Momo, maybe Bonnie could use her aging fruit to turn him back into a kid, but that's only if he would want that, I guess. Um, but but yeah, it seems like, um, you know, Momo has control over this form, and he can, you know, take Luffy on a ride. I, I guess Shinobu and the Heart Pirates are going to go too, and, you know, he can maybe control the flame clouds and maybe do Boro Breath and everything like that. Um, and we don't see Momo as an adult yet. We just see him in the dragon form. Uh, he might have control over his hybrid form now. That could be a thing, too. And we can see hybrid Momonosuke fighting against hybrid Kaido together in, like, a, a man-dragon face-off. Like, that would be cool. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that... That was the chapter. There are so many follow-ups I have to make to this. I have to make a video about the Lunarians. I have to make a video about uh, the Raid Suit. I have to make a video about Momo. I mean, like, there's so much stuff to talk about here. This was an insane chapter. How long have I been filming now? I had to take a break halfway through. All right, this has been recording for an hour, but I had to take a break there, and I messed up a few times. So probably over 50 minutes. Easy, though. Oh, man. All right. Well, anyway... Uh, Hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, oh, and then Ryuma. And then we find out about Ryuma and Ushimaru. Like, this was the chapter. Oda's like, here, break next week, I believe. So that's probably the reason Oda just threw all this stuff in here now. Plus, we got the cover page spread that looked epic. I mean, it's incredible. Okay. Well, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, you know, stay tuned for videos this week. It's going to be great. It's nice to be back. Uh, Barry, why don't you uh, sing us a song out? <sighs> Bye, everyone.